We have two microphones uh, in the audience as well. So when uh, we ask, uh, when if, if you have any questions, uh, we'd like you to and tell us who you are. Take the microphone. We'll have somebody actually bring the microphone to you so we can all um, hear your questions. All right. So um, first of all, actually, I would like to um, give a round of applause to our wonderful speakers for all the inspiration that we had this morning. There was obviously um, a lot of information, a lot of material, and wonderful ideas that they shared with us this morning. Um, I have uh, some questions of my own, but I don't want to um, start with my own questions. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to? OK, please. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor, and it truly is awesome to have heard what we've heard today. I work at a design school, industrial design school. Um, my students have written some questions. Maybe I could pass them forward. My question as a professor is how can I inspire? What can I do for my students to help them to work with you? How can they find the possibilities of working with you? As uh, someone who's reached out to different scientists to collaborate, I would just say that um, it's important to translate the spirit of enthusiasm and curiosity. And when I think of the classes that I teach, I know that problem solving and creativity are at the core of both science and art. And I think when we think about the Renaissance or when things were very combined, and like we've said, they weren't separated, I think just like a curiosity about the natural world is something very simply that both artists and scientists can think of. And I, I would say that it, you know, if a designer is interested in working with an engineer or scientist, at least the things that I've seen with my students is that they're just really passionate about what they do and they share that spirit and that kind of foundation of, of the thrill of discovery. I would uh, just say yes, and for the students, a dream, anything is possible. And anyone you want to work with, I think, is possible. So if anyone ever tells you no, just don't listen. Is the answer is yes, and you just make it happen. And so from being a former academic, and we've met Dr. Krakow, Dr. Guido Baroni is here. You usually just have to ask. You have to do your homework, be really good, and research. And once you have the knowledge and read someone's work or experience it, then say, can I come join your team for a summer or for graduate school or for a real job? I'll, I'll turn it to the, the professionals who actually hire people. But again, never be afraid to ask. And any, you know, again, no, don't put any limits on what you want to attain. Well, uh, no, uh, briefly, um, ha having taught uh, pretty much uh, space studios you know, and, and, and design, um, I think is a great source of inspiration. I think uh, whether you're involved in the program or not, uh, by, I think that what Deva said is first uh, getting yourself acquainted to the problem, but presenting a space problem is a great exercise on problem solving from the design point of view. So it doesn't matter really about whether you're going to be having a career in space, but space itself, it, it allows you to think about things that you don't think designing for Earth uh, products. So that in itself and the research process and the, and the discovery process of, of space activities it could lead you into really a career of it. Uh, so. Um, I find it that uh, students are very, very inspired by uh, working on, on all kinds of space activities, uh, space projects that we've done anywhere from architecture to, to the, you know, fashion. <laughs> okay, next question, please. Can you hear me? Is that? So this is a question for Nicole. Um, it was really interesting to hear about, you know, your experiences and, and to think, you know, how difficult it likely is to, to you know, describe what that experience of space is and using words like beauty and artful in a way, maybe they're not full enough to really talk about what that was like. So coming out of that experience, I'm curious, what was art making for you? And how did that bring a sense of complexity to that experience? And, and how is that, what does that give you as a language of expression that something like mathematics or science or other forms of investigation couldn't give you in that way? Well, th thank you for the question, because I, I think for me, um, in this transition stage that I'm in, in this, uh, you know, pushing off on this new adventure is the way I'm looking at it, um, it, it was a difficult decision to, to um, 
retire from the astronaut office. Um, first, I had to uh, get over the fact that um, I wouldn't go to space, to get, uh, space again. Um, I can tell you that's a very hard th thing to do when you know that you're in the lineup to fly again. But I had to honestly answer the question, is it important for me to fly in space again? And when I honestly asked that question, it, the answer is no, it's not important for me to do it again. Then I had to get over, and I think of this more as the selfish side. Um, the astronaut job is 99.99% of that time is not flying in space. But the things you're doing down here on Earth are, I would say, equally as incredible. The people you work with, the, um, the new programs that you're supporting, um, and the really cool opportunity to fly in airplanes like T-38s, to dive in large swimming pools, you know, training for spacewalks. Those are things that you, you don't do outside of NASA. And so I had to be, get the warm fuzzy about not doing that anymore. And when I finally came to that conclusion, I think it's important for all of us to figure out how we take that next step and share this really um, incredible experience that we've had. And, and for me, I just kept coming back to the art. I, I think the inspiration for it was the opportunity to paint while I was in space. And there was a connection for me um, to our planet, to the, our spacecraft, to my crew that came through having that opportunity to paint. And when I was making this decision, it it became obvious to me that art was the unique way that I could share the experience. And that's going to be painting myself, supporting projects like the Spacesuit Art Project, where I see this very natural tie between art and science and something like healing, um, to be able to participate in uh, activities like this, where it's a much broader uh, communication of this just natural interaction between science and art. But I think in the end, it's about the connection. It's about trying to share this, I don't know, almost emotional, um, and like Shannon Lucid said, you know, romantic side of the experience. And I think that comes from having seen it with my own eyes, and not just seeing it, but feeling it and wanting to maintain that feeling inside of me somehow, but also at the time, same time try to share it. And I don't know if that explains it any better <laughs> than before, but um, I, I think it comes down to connection and sharing the experience in a unique way. Okay, please. Hi, um, I'm really fascinated by the overview effect, and I wanted to know how this notion has affected your work in science, design, and art, even though you probably haven't experienced by firsthand. Well, one of you. I will start by saying that it just, um, I've, I've spent a lot of time speaking about this idea of the overview effect. Um, it, it's legit. <laughs> And uh, I think that uh, ultimately what comes from it is what in some way all of us shared today is this idea of, um, I love this you know, Buckminster Fuller spaceship Earth. I love the idea of us thinking about our planet as one and uh, we are all you know, crew members on board, on board that spaceship. Um, and I think ultimately the overview effect is a reinforcement of that. It's, um, it's the call to us to um, take action on the challenges that we globally share. And, and ultimately, if we can use the vantage point of space to encourage people to work together um, on one planet, Deva has said it numerous times now about this being, through our space programs, this is an us thing, it's a we thing, it's not one country or another, it's about us as Earthlings. To go to the next question, I just say so. Uh, overview effect to me is a repackaging of, of the genius of Buckminster Fuller again, uh, calling out that it is spaceship Earth, and when you have that perspective, 
if you're living on a spaceship together, you think about the holistic, you think about the entire system, so that's every single being on the Earth, as well as what we're doing to, to our own Earth. And so it's just to look at it, Earth, as a system, and uh, again, it's good to look at it as your own spaceship or your own boat and craft, because you know we all have to figure this out together. And if we thought about that every day for our decisions, especially our global decisions, we might make different decisions when we have that perspective of, of oneness and holistic and that we're all on this earth together. Hello, I'm Luca. I'm an industrial design student here in Florence from ISEA. I don't know, the same school as Mrs. Pug. And I think our own goal at our school is to meet, to solve the riddle of arts and sciences, so this very symposium theme. And I was wondering, and I, w I wanted to ask the designers and the artists, what, are, what is your own idea, your own definition of art, since thinking about this mixing, this uh, dichotomy, I'd say, makes us want to reshape the definition, makes us wonder every day what art is and what science is, what psyche is and what techno is. What is it to you, and then, what is beauty for you? What um, Christopher McCandles used to say, said once, happiness is true only if shared. Is it true even for beauty? You want me to define beauty? No problem. <laughs> Are you sure you? No, really. <laughs> um, what is, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think that's a great question because um, I asked that to myself about my relationship to my studio practice. I've been, you know, exhibiting as an artist for about 15 years now. And I think for me, it's um, it comes down to kind of creation and making something new for your own self to try to offer it to an audience. And um, I think this um, the injection of all these wonderful technologies is wonderful, but also to kind of turn around and look at the lineage of where you came from to try to move us forward. And I think in that, th that sense, that that's where beauty is. It's not something that's just aesthetic. It's something that creates something in your, in your heart. You know, I mean, one of my favorite quotes is, Ed Ruscha, and he says that he wants to look at something and say, wow, what is that? Versus what is that? Wow. The wow comes first. And, I, and for me, that's, that's the beauty, is that newness, the impact, the, the punch in the gut when you see or hear something new. If I can add as well, just from an academic perspective and also having been a designer for many years, I think it's a terrific question that you ask and it's an absolutely relevant question and we are all faced with the changes and what our role is as a designer and artist today, particularly now with new technology and with the integration of all the different disciplines. So that's happening and we hear the term design thinking and I think that's an interesting term and related to artists as well where uh, we no longer think in isolation, and I think that the role of the artist today is much more about problem solving, about what, is, what can you do to contribute, not just to expressing yourself, which I think is important too, but how you can convey and, uh, and, and express to others uh, our life, about sustainability, about politics, and the complexity of our 21st living today. So I think that uh, I would encourage, and this was the purpose of this uh, symposium, was not so much as inspiring as the, uh, all the talks were about space. It's the parallel uh, challenges for artists and what our roles are. And, and, and you've seen today that the artist has an opportunity to engage with disciplines that you ordinarily wouldn't even think about engaging with, whether it's philanthropists and astrophysicists and geologists and so on and so forth, and chefs. Uh, but it's about coming together and solving problems in a creative way, and that gets to beauty. So the creativity aspect is, as an artist, you want to be able to portray something in a beautiful way, and that is a form of expression that takes from symbols and iconology and the expression that people can relate to it using whatever medium possible. It could be through painting and it could be through digital media or 3D printing. If I can add, add something, I actually think that the categorization that we've seen before as art, design, 
uh, engineering and the other one was uh, science, science. science. doesn't really work anymore. It's like, it's a categorization based, in my opinion, mostly on the medium, on what I do, but I'd rather categorize by why I do something, like, is it ethical, my reason? I can be a designer because I want to do something ethical, but I can paint to give a message that's ethical. I can do fashion design, maybe only to get uh, for an economic reason, so that's, I wouldn't say it's design, because I think design is ethical, but I'd rather start define people by why they do something rather than what they do. Thank well you. Said. Well said. Next question, please. Hi, um, I'm Emily. I'm a student of Visual Arts Administration with NYU. And I understand that NASA has also recently reopened their artist in residence program. And I was wondering if, for arts administrators, you had any advice on to how best foster opportunities such as those to help this interchange between art and science. Exactly. So uh, thanks for the question. Again, I, um, it's uh, not exactly an artist in residence program. We've had them in, you know, for 50 years, and I say in the past next 50 years, we need uh, the artists. And so in terms of working with us, uh, our door is, is open and trying to figure out, uh, I'm actually trying to put in an um, umbrella agreement, you know, a Space Act agreement, we call these, so that artists uh, can come in. And uh, Nicole's recent project she talked about with that, we just want to say, who's doing great things out there? And then a lot of times uh, for artists um, to use our materials, everything is free from, from NASA. All the images, everything is available available, but a lot of people don't know where to start. So, you know, it's jump on our website, but if you need help, make resources available. And a lot of times that's just contacts and people and where can you access the materials, what you can do with it, um, coming onto our centers to experience uh, some of these things, like, you know, like a launch or the facilities so that you can embed that into some of your work. So, so it's not a specific artist in residence program because actually that would be too limiting, but it's how do you want to work with us and how can we make available, um, you know, data and images and, and I was just, uh, and sound, you know, a sound an art, a sound artist is, there's a new something on iTunes, you know, to explore the universe. So just trying to make so much of what we have available and uh, engaging and again, then spending some time with us as, as well as um, the direction we're trying to, time, trying to embrace uh, and work together. Hi, I'm Brittany. I'm the professor of animation here at Saatchi, and I've also worked in the film and animation industry. So there have been a lot of movies recently about um, science and space exploration, like Interstellar and Gravity and The Martian. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about these movies, the stories they're telling, and how they represent the science and space community. <laughs> you should go. So The Martian was great. <laughs> How many people saw The Martian? I hope you all saw it. The Martian was great. At NASA, we're the real Martians. Um, and uh, they got the technology right. First, the book. Andy Weir wrote a great book. He did so much great research. He got everything wrong. There's three technologies that they didn't get right. I can take it offline. I only have three quibbles and, you know, hundreds of wonderful things, like only three little uh, things. And, uh, and they knew about it as well. The wind, for instance. There's not hurricanes. There's tons of dust devils on Mars, but it's 1% atmosphere, so it feels like a feather. But Andy said, I know, I've researched that, but that wouldn't make a good story, would it? He needed hurricane winds. And uh, so that's, I think, a great example that just, well, my personal opinion, I mean, gravity was unbelievably beautiful. I mean, I think it captured, it, it got the wow, it was beautiful. I wasn't gonna go because um, the storyline and the plot uh, wasn't particularly fond of, and I, anyhow, so I was judging it. Did they get the physics right? And, uh, you know, thought it was a pretty silly plot. And Katie Coleman, which is a very close, close uh, astronaut friend of, friend of ours, she opened it for NASA and said, Dave, just go, you'll enjoy, it's a movie, just go. And sure enough, I was so glad Gee and I went in 3D because after seeing Gravity for three nights, I dreamt and floated, and I was in microgravity. So that, because I've done a lot of microgravity parabolas, and so I went back to space because of gravity. So thank you. So I shouldn't have judged, you know, on the physical, you know, and the physics and the technical. Interstellar, <clears throat> yeah, I, don't, I, think, I think they missed it. <laughs> to me, the classic is still 2001 Space Odyssey, and if, no, if, if some of you guys, young guys haven't seen it, I, I would recommend it. It's slow but it's absolutely gorgeous, and, and the story is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I could say a few words about watching Kip Thorne make um, Interstellar. This is one of the first times that a scientist actually originated a movie. So this wasn't that Steven Spielberg wrote the treatment and then asked Kip if the physics was correct. It was that Kip was interested in, in if uh, knowing him for so long, it's almost like, to me, when I watch that movie, it's like a, a riddle. He's like, you go through a world, there's three worlds. How are you going to figure it out? And I think that, um, uh, like David was saying with The Martian, there's essentially one portion where Christopher Nolan said, when you go through the black hole, they recreate, they did the mathematics. And what's interesting about Interstellar is that out of Interstellar, they published two technical papers about black holes that they didn't know about because double negative had done the visual effects. So I actually learned by making the movie <laughs> of visualizing black holes um, and other, and so basically Basically, that the section of going through the black holes was uh, dramatized, and uh, also the um, the part at the end, the tesseract, which is a big question that's also kind of speculative. But it was true to the science, and um, I think for me, again, like I said when I was talking, that someone like Kip Thorne, Stephen Hawking, there it's public now that they're creating, they're writing the treatment for another movie together, and that they're very excited about translating the enthusiasm and excitement of science into the popular world and that it's originating from science rather than someone saying like, you know, we'll, we'll just make it kind of look science-y, so. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I will say, I think the common theme in all of these answers has been the um, generation of curiosity. And, you know, I will tell you honestly, I go to these movies, I think if you're in any profession and you, there's a movie about what you do, um, you will go there and you will be the one, you know, saying, okay, the earth doesn't rotate in that direction. Okay, that wouldn't, ha you know, those kind of, that wouldn't happen. They would never say that, that kind of stuff. But I will tell you, I am so thankful um, that these kinds of movies are made because I think what it does, it just, it spurs the curiosity. I know there are people that know we have a space station now because of gravity, that did not have a clue we had a space station before. And it, it, anything that we can do to generate that interest in a positive way that takes people to looking up at the night sky and seeing that, you know, that light that crosses and know that there are six people living and working on that space station is important to me. And I think it de definitely does generate the, the questions and then the follow-on science, and I would say also art, um, comes from it that's really, really important. Um, is this right? Uh, my name's Kitty. I uh, kid you not. Um, but, um, Leah, I was really, really enthralled by uh, what you described of your book that you'll be doing with Kip Thorne. I'm gonna Amazon that. And it got me thinking uh, about the literary arts because Galileo presented his treatises as dialogues. Kepler wrote a story about going to the moon. We have Alan Lightman and Carl Sagan's a gangster. And I was wondering what any of y'all in um, the studio or at NASA thought about the place of the literary arts and the written word in the whole narrative of people in space. Um, I'll just answer in terms of what I, Kip and I, when we started making this book, um, it actually started off as a kind of short article uh, that was for the um, the magazine Playboy, and we were in, yes, we were invited to um, to make a kind of short. Um, description about warp space and then it just kind of grew from there and that we decided to not publish there and we kept saying that we didn't know who would want this book because it's such a strange it's not a um, kind of didactic approach or a technical approach to science um, but that it would be kind of experiment you know experiential um, and um, I think we're making the book that we would want to look at and um, the you know that I don't know, is it a coffee book? Is it a coffee table book that you look at images? Is it an art book? Is it a monograph? Is it a, um, you know, something that you actually can learn from science? And, um, you know, I think it's somewhere in between. And, and um, just like a film is one way to get a certain kind of audience, I think a book can offer a certain kind of experience. 
in the literary side, I mean, yes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm remiss. Um, to me, the you know, arts and, and literary is really important. Almost many, many astronauts have then written a book after their experience because, again, that's um, you know the way that they want to tell the story. And so, and we bring in again, we need uh, storytellers and we need uh, literary from 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 poetry to literature to nonfiction. I mean, the whole the whole spectrum of literature, absolutely. I think actually uh, <laughs> the beginning of you know humanity thinking about uh, space and traveling to space uh, it goes back to you know kind of tribal uh, stories that were told about around a fire you know about the mythologies you know and like a, you know Native American Indians and you know and ma and many cultures around the world you know they were telling stories about you know there are some ways to reach the stars, you know, the different drawings of the galaxies and so on, and every culture is different. So from there all the way to Jules Verne, you know, going to, to, uh, to it was a great inspiration for me. It's just like, you know, going to the moon and uh, the, the, the amount of Im imagination, but also with incredible um, certainty and, and, and studying, you know, kind of uh, projecting the physics, the mathematics involved, you know, how close m many of the assumptions were. You know, Arthur C. Clarke is, ex you know, this 2001 Space Odyssey, um, you know, just uh, very, very uh, a science fiction, but realistic fiction. Uh, that is, there is a possibility, and I think that's where dreams are built. Uh, and, and, it, and this is passed from generation to generation. So I think actually that maybe in the literary, literature and the storytelling is the, the beginning you know, from uh, where we are today. You know, I think all the things that we're doing about space, and that's why I think that uh, you know, I mentioned the seeds are planted. They, you know, they were planted way back, but now we're really grounded. We're growing in space, you know, as humans traveling, and and I can project. Uh, you know, obviously we're all anxious about getting to the moon and Mars, and you know, in our business we're all frustrated because you know I wanted to build a lunar base about 20 years ago, you know, and we still haven't gone back to the moon, but. Uh, we will colonize the moon, we will go to Mars, and we will be, um, you know, a space-faring uh, civilization, you know, because of these stories and because of these things that we are genetically inclined about, you know, discovery and, and, and exploration. Roberta, painting conservation teacher. It's Sachi. It's Sachi, <laughs> obviously. So, first thing, two practical questions. You have invited photographers, artists to come on board. Age and physical requisites that they should have. Am I still in time, 56? No, she is already retired, so who can come on a space? Ah, who's, 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 who's going to come to space? Uh, I, uh, to paint. And second, how could you do, excuse me, how could you do watercolors and how, I mean, <laughs> it's not easy because it's difficult to eat, difficult to go to restroom, difficult to sleep. I think painting, it's even more difficult, but. All right. Well, I, I, I hope that, I, ho I hope we've, uh, you know, when you look back on the history of space flight, um, I think Alexei Leonov was the first to draw in space. Um, if you've gone to the cosmonaut exhibit, um, they have his, his pencils, his colored pencils on display and the drawing that he did. He has continued that artistic trend after flying in space. Actually, I think he wanted to be an artist before he wanted to be an astronaut, and the way to get to be an artist was to be an engineer and then a pilot and fly in space, um, kind of the indirect route. but. Um, I, th I think we're going to continue to see more and more artists in space. I think we're going to see it as part of our astronaut population because in that, that picture I showed you of my astronaut class, I think more and more we're recognizing that, that the diversity across the people we have as astronauts as well as the, the different kinds of things that individuals enjoy and want to do will just naturally take itself to space as well. And I really look forward to mo more people painting in space, to more people drawing, to more people doing music in space. All of, all of that, I think, is just gonna continue to grow as we continue to explore. Um, watercolors in space, I'll tell you, in, in the end, like, like all of the things, I think you have to go to space knowing it's gonna be an adventure, knowing it's not gonna be like here on Earth in 1G. And I can tell you that even going to the bathroom, eating, all of it is, is, 
is some, in some ways better than down here, um, and not so hard once you get the knack of it. Painting in space, a little bit different. I had a watercolor kit. I think, like here, when you paint with watercolors, you have to be um, very deliberate about taking care not to make a huge mess, although sometimes the messes are equally as beautiful as what you paint on your, on your paper. Um, but water behaves differently, so I just was very careful to squirt out the tiniest little ball of water from my drink bag. And the way uh, surface tension, and you know, this is this whole science and art kind of thing too. You take the tip of your brush and you just touch it to that little ball of water and it just completely wicks it right into the brush. You don't have to push it around or anything, it just sucks it right up into the brush. And then you can, like here on Earth, m you know, mush your brush around in the paints and then when you transfer it to the paper, it does the same thing. I could almost see the paint like moving from the brush onto the paper. So that was a little bit different, but it was so cool to watch it. Just watch this action of you know, microgravity taking place uh, on the paper. And, um, and then really it's just about being careful with, with, your, um, with your supplies because in space, organization is key. Everything has Velcro on it. If you let go of something, it's gonna go on its own way. And, um, but I, I wish somebody would just send me back to space so I could paint some more. <laughs> Looking at you. <laughs> uh, we are going to have um, dozens and hundreds and hopefully thousands to ten thousands of people in space, hopefully in our, in our lifetimes. But I see the next decade in low Earth orbit. Uh, what we're doing is government agencies around the world and NASA, we're saying we want to commercialize low Earth orbit. So that's where we're funding our private companies and things to get so that we can have, because each space agency of the world is only going to have a few astronauts. Our job, I think, as a space agency is get to people then to the moon and to Mars. That's what exploration is all about. But people living and working in low Earth orbit, I mean, whoever wants to go, we have to make it more affordable and we have to get the launch capability up. But I think that's coming to you very soon. And so we drive down those costs, then we can all go and uh, be in, in orbit, which would be very cool. And so all artists are very welcome. I hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I would. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to, uh, I think we've come Sorry, to an student. end, and if you can maybe hold the questions for the end, because oh. uh, okay. we just hit the yes. two o'clock mark here. Um, if I can just say a few things. Um, um, the one thing that stands out for me in this morning's session, in the symposium, is the many attempts and struggles to achieve great things and the many failures. And what I would say for all the students in the audience, failure is not a bad thing. I think it was said this morning. And if you strive to do something and you want to do it well, you will fail, and you'll fail often. And it's good to fail often, but you learn from that process. And I think this morning has been an extraordinary learning process for me, I hope for all of you. And I want to thank Vittorio, I want to thank Guy, Deva, Leah, Nicole and Donatella for her lovely translation. She has a photographic memory. And then to invite you not to forget, this is our building, Saatchi. Uh, this is the facade of our building. At 3.30 we have our installation and performances and, and all of the, the relic, uh, sorry, the, um, the Galileo telescope uh, replica and so on, uh, which we welcome you to come and enjoy with us and probably continue the conversation. So I thank you for joining us and wish you the rest of the, a good a good day for the rest of the day thank you, thank you.